Good evening. Welcome, everyone, our panelists, our audience. We're so glad that you could join us this afternoon. We're here today to talk about teacher recruitment in Providence. And specifically, what we'd like to discuss today is to what extent is the Providence Public School District, um, how are they attracting a sufficient um, pool of well-qualified applicants to its open positions, and what can be done to improve this pool moving forward? This panel is the first in a series of several panels that we do plan to host about teacher staffing in Providence. It's part of a larger body of work from our ongoing research partnership um, with between the Center on the Study of Educators at Annenberg, PPSD, and the Rhode Island Department of Education. With this panel today, we tried to bring together a diverse group of stakeholders uh, covering researchers, district leaders, principals, uh, community leaders and members of several community design teams that were instrumental in providing recommendations for Providence's current turnaround plan. So without further ado, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our panelists this evening. So we have Nkoli Anye, who is a first generation Nigerian American. She has taught high school chemistry and biology across the United States, ranging from Alaska to South Central LA, Georgia, and right here in Providence, Rhode Island. In addition to teaching in Providence, Nicole has served as an instructional coach, a high school principal, and a cabinet level central office administrator. She's also developed several district wide programs to support teacher recruitment, retention, and reform here in Providence. She currently serves as the principal at Gilbert Stewart Middle School. She holds a BS in microbiology from California State University an MA in education from the University of Rhode Island and is in the final stages of completing her doctorate in educational reform. Congrats, Nicole, and thank you for being here this evening. We have also with us Paige Clausius Parks, who is a licensed Rhode Island secondary social studies teacher who began her teaching career as a teacher advisor at the Met High School. She's currently a senior policy analyst at Rhode Island Kids Count which is an equity focused advocacy and policy organization working to improve the health, safety, education, economic security and develop development of Rhode Island children by aiming to close a multitude of disparities that have been brought on by structural racism. Paige is responsible for policy analysts, advocacy and project management in areas related to education and economic well-being for our children. She serves as a member of the Providence Review Board and co-chaired the Excellence in Learning Subcommittee of the Community Design Team. Welcome, Paige. We have with us Zach Scott, who currently serves as Deputy Superintendent of Operations at Providence Public Schools, where he oversees HR, finance, and administration efforts. Zach previously has held roles in DC Public Schools, Boston Public Schools, and the Parthenon Group. Zach holds an AB from Harvard University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Welcome, Scott. And we have Dr. John Pape, who is an Associate Professor of Education and Economics at Brown and runs the Center for the Study of Educators at the Annenberg Institute. Like many of our other panelists, John is also a, a former teacher, a specifically high school history teacher. Most of his research focuses on educational inequality and how educational policies affect teachers and the profession. So welcome panelists, welcome audience, and we will get right into our discussion this evening. So John, I'd like to start with you. Uh, my question to you is, can you actually share with us some of the findings from your most recent research um, and policy brief? And with that, what does the data tell us about the state of teacher recruitment here in Providence? Thanks, uh, Soljan, and thanks everyone for for being here. We're very excited about this uh, this panel. Um, this is the the second brief um, in a in a series of briefs that we that we're doing here related to teacher staffing. Um, the first dealt with um, teacher vacancies in um, um, and this brief focuses on teacher recruitment. So I wanted to just spend a few minutes sharing um, some of the key findings from uh, from this work uh, and. We can put in the chat the link to the brief if you um, if you, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, so four key findings here that I wanted to highlight. First is that Providence receives relatively few ap applications compared to other uh, school districts across the country, um, particularly in high needs subjects. So 
it's hard to get national data on this, but the best data we have uh, says that the average teaching position gets about 28 applications um, per position. In Providence, over the past four years that we've been looking at, um, we see that on average, teaching positions are getting many fewer uh, than that. Uh, in, in the most recent school year, only 14, so about half um, of, of the national average. And this isn't evenly distributed across teaching areas. Now, this, this matches national, national trends, but we see that there are many more people applying for elementary generalist positions, for example, than for positions um, uh, for teachers of English learners or in uh, science or mathematics or, uh, or in um, uh, teachers of students with disabilities. The second key finding is that Providence attracted, um, has, has done some things differently, right? And Providence and Ride began doing some things differently over the past couple of years. And we are seeing a, 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 some changes over time. Providence attracted more out-of-state applicants this year, um, but we actually saw no increase in applications per position to high need subjects. So if we look at the number of unique applications, uh, the unique applicants who are applying in Providence, we see that the number of folks from Rhode Island is staying relatively flat, but the number of folks from out of state is increasing uh, over time. Uh, and there's a, a good chance we think that this has, may have something to do with the changes in the reciprocity um, uh, policies um, from RIDE. For example, over the past three years, about 11% of applicants in Providence came from Massachusetts. This year, about 17% came from Massachusetts. So we're seeing an increase um, in in applications from out of state, but these are largely concentrating in subjects that are not hard to staff, right? So not in science, not in mathematics, not for teachers of students with disabilities, not for teachers of English learners, um, but they're concentrating, the increase in applications is concentrating in other subject areas. The third key finding highlights one of the big challenges uh, facing, uh, facing Providence, which is ensuring that the teaching workforce more adequately reflects uh, the demographics of the, of the student body. So we see that about this year, about 26% of, of the applicants were teachers of color. Um, that is uh, somewhat more than the 20% of uh, teachers of color in the, in the district, but um, basically similar to, or even a little bit less than um, the share of the new hires that are, that are teachers of color. Um, and any of these rates are not sufficient to meet the goals set out uh, by Providence in the Turnaround Action Plan um, of dramatically increasing the diversity of the teacher workforce. Uh, so we've been trying to understand uh, what's going on here, and I know that uh, lo there's lots of, uh, lots of insight um, from, from other folks here, but one of the things that we've been uh, looking at in the data is how folks are finding out about positions in, in Providence, and we see big differences um, by uh, for, for, for white candidates compared to, to applicants of color. Um, applicants of color are much less likely to find out about positions through school spring. Um, so school spring is the, the is Providence's um, teacher hiring uh, software system. And, uh, and most candidates report on their forms that they found out about positions through school spring. That's how they were referred to positions in the district. Um, that's less true for applicants of color. Applicants of, applicants of color are much more likely um, to hear about positions through referrals from, uh, from current teaching staff or from other people working in Providence. Um, so it does seem like there are different levers that we, we might be thinking about um, as we're thinking about diversifying the teacher workforce. And then the final uh, finding has to do with salary. Um, salary, right, is just one factor. Um, and I think there's good research from it from elsewhere that salary is is uh, is is not the hot not the most important thing um, that determines whether folks enter teaching or or which which teaching positions they they choose. But it does it does factor in, um, and we see sort of comparing national to national data that Providence novice teacher salaries are fairly low compared to other large districts. Um, uh, there's some some evidence collected about the the top 150 districts. Um, Providence would rank about 88th for, for novice teacher salaries out of those 150 districts. But Providence in Providence teacher salaries um, end up becoming quite high. Um, so by year 10, um, the teachers rank eighth out of those 148 districts. Uh, and so it does seem that there is this, uh, this difference across the career uh, in, in teacher salaries. So 
that's the the sort of high level findings that we that we had. Um, we have in the in the brief we lay out lots of recommendations, and hopefully we can dig into some of those and, and other other insights as we uh, move forward. Thanks. Thank you, John. Two points I did want to make that I neglected to make in my excitement to introduce the panel is I am Sol J. Martinez and I'm the education coordinator at the Annenberg Institute. And we will be uh, allotting some time at the end, towards the end of our discussion tonight for open Q&A with our audience. And thank you for that. Okay, so John, thank you for that really um, you know, broad picture of recruitment. I want to turn it over to the panel now and ask if each of you from where you sit, could really uh, tell us what does teacher recruitment look like in the district? What are the real opportunities and what are the challenges? And I'll, I'll leave it open. We can start with Nicole. So I, I can speak from a, I'll speak from a school standpoint as a principal. Um, of course, we rely on um, on applications that we receive from HR, but I think one of the uh, responsibilities uh, that are important for a principal is to really um, be aggressive around um, recruitment. And so one of the things that um, I've tried to do here is really reach out to our uh, Providence Public School graduates, high school and college graduates, uh, many of whom who uh, many of whom are really not able to find jobs after they actually graduate from college and are quite local. And, and also when I speak to them, they actually have been searching for a way to give back to, to Providence. So we've been really fortunate here to have been able to recruit uh, young people who, are, who have degrees um, and are, are willing to put up the time, money and resources necessary to um, become full-time permanent teachers through the emergency certification process that exists um, and um, they require quite a bit of support. So one of the things we're doing here to make sure that they uh, are supported and feel connected and feel a sense of community is really making sure that we meet with them. We actually have a new teacher mini induction program here at Gilbert Stewart Middle School where we meet with those teachers every week. And we talk about every topic you can think of, grading and assessment uh, to climate and culture, et cetera. But well, when I spoke with them the other day and told them I was gonna do this panel, um, they uh, they talked about a couple of things that they felt were uh, opportunities, and that is the fact that there are so many students here uh, in Rhode Island who really would be very interested in coming back to be teachers if they have the information. And so um, the way we recruited them was by word of mouth, and um, that's how really most of them were able to get here, but they really did not understand the process. Uh, they said that a lot of our young people who would be interested don't really understand the process and how to access the information for uh, teaching positions and also don't even realize that if they have a degree, especially in a high need area such as you know chemistry, physics, uh, mathematics, that there's an opportunity for them to find an alternative way to enter the profession. So that was that was that was loud and clear. Um, and also um, the idea of a systemized way of supporting young people. So they know after speaking to many of their counterparts in other schools, that this is a unique opportunity they have here where we meet with them every week. And one of the things they, they thought about was really having a systemized way as a district for really inducting and supporting new teachers uh, over the first three years of uh, entering the profession so that they, um, they have, we have a systemized way of really supporting them and giving them what they need to be really successful. Thank you. Uh, Zach, I'd love to get your perspective from the district level. Of course, and I mean, ditto to everything Dr. Oni said, um, or Dr. Oni said, um, because I think that we try to make sure a couple things that the, from the district perspective that we're doing all we can to support our school-based hiring teams with recruiting and hiring great talent. So a couple of kind of things we're proud of and then and then areas to, to continue moving on. So. One is on our just our general hiring policies and practices. I think we made some headway last year in moving our hiring timeline earlier, uh, which allowed us to hire and fill vacancies and, and hire more diverse candidates, which was which was great. But lots more to do in terms of um, removing barriers for our school-based hiring teams to hire the best candidates we have, uh, that are available. So that is something we need to continue doing because um, it, it's kind of a good condition 
or baseline that, that we can work against. But you know, from the data that we just looked at, there's a whole lot of room for improvement. Um, recruitment and I think we th that that data that John shared just so strikes me as how far below we are in, in terms of the district average and so we've made some moves in our HR department to to reposition some of our work more towards recruitment uh, compared to some of that other work and so I'm hoping that you know, that happened over the summer that that will yield results this year um, so I'm optimistic but there's a lot of room to, to gain and figure out what you know and answer some of the fundamental questions about why we are where we are in terms of the number of applications we get. Um, and then, then lastly, I think it's around pay and incentives. So, you know, it is good to know we are, you know, Rhode Island compared to national figures is, is you know, paying our teachers um, uh, is fairly high, but, but we in Providence wanna recruit the best. Um, and particularly in those areas like STEM, um, uh, supporting our differently able learners, um, and our multilingual learners. So finding ways that we can think about uh, incentives and it doesn't need to be pay, right? Like I think people come to the district to work for people like Nicole. I mean, it, it's not just pay, it's who that's really important, but to the extent pay matters that we can do things in targeted ways to not, to, 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 bring, um, to bring people in those areas that we really need them. So I think, you know, we've got some good stuff working for us, but, but lots of room to, to work, uh, work towards. Thank you, Zach. And Paige, I'd love to hear from you from both the, the policy side, but also you having co-chaired the Excellence in Learning design, Community Design Team, I'm sure that uh, many of the discussions centered around opportunities and challenges and recruitment. So could you share with us what some of those uh, entailed? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and first, thank you, Sol Jane and the Annenberg Institute for inviting me to be on this panel. This is a really important conversation to have. Um, it's one of the top priority issues for Rhode Island Kids Count and so happy to be here with um, great panelists and this great conversation. Um, so yes, recruiting, um, retaining educators of color was one of the top priority areas for the community design team and the world-class talent um, subcommittee. Many of the recommendations and observations that they noted are also noted in this report or reference in this brief. Um, the need to have more educators to reflect um, the, the makeup of the student body in Providence, um, educators who are trained and supported in culturally responsive education um, and trauma-informed education and curriculum was really important to the CDT team, as well as addressing school climate, which was also mentioned in this brief. Um, many of the recommendations around recruiting and retaining educators of color are also very similar to the recommendations on how to best address excellence in learning for students. Um, and I just come back to, as I was reading this brief, much of what is good for students, I find is also good for educators. And if we wanna do well by students of color, we're also doing well for educators of color and to recruit those educators. Um, some opportunities that I saw as reading through this brief that I was really excited about is that it seems like there's an opportunity to really align um, both the goals and strategies to recruit um, educators of color and align it with the turnaround plan strategies and excellence in learning and align it also to some of the strategies that will be needed to recover from this pandemic. So some of the things that I'm talking about like specifically is the turnaround plan driven by the community design team called for and demanded an anti-racist education and a culturally responsive education. And by offering an anti-racist education and curriculum, it's great for students. Again, really important selling piece when you're trying to recruit highly qualified educators of color. Um, this year, PPSD has done some really interesting um, opening up dialogue with students and educators around anti-racism, diversity, um, biasness, all of those great programs that are coming out of PPSD. I think it would be really interesting to also put that as part of the recruitment efforts. Are we letting future educators applicants know that these events are happening, that Providence is putting in tremendous effort to become an anti-racist school system. I think that's some really great potential there. 
Um, also, as we're talking about recovering from this pandemic, a lot of the research is showing that small group instruction is going to be key, some high quality individualized small group instruction to help kids um, pick back up in their learning and kind of accelerate their learning that they may have um, not had the opportunity to have during school closures in the pandemic. And I see in this report, the talk of how do we recruit folks who are outside of our current application pool. Wouldn't it be an awesome idea that we can bring in folks to maybe lead, run some of these small group sessions with students and we're kind of building in an opportunity to recruit future educators or future applicants. And then school climate. School climate is so important. Um, for anyone who's followed the social media talk around this event, Educators are talking about the climate conditions in school as being a major factor and being able to recruit educators and students are saying the same exact thing. Um, so I was happy to see that in this brief. I'm looking forward to opportunities to really align these efforts because it will make a big difference for students and a big difference in our recruitment. Thank you, Paige. So I'd like to address the next question to Zach, John and Nicole. A lot of the research around teacher recruitment and increasing the supply of teachers focuses on long-term investments in creating new pipelines for teachers. This is the wish list question. If you had a million dollars to invest in strengthening the supply of teachers to the state, where would you invest it and why? I don't mind starting because I, I, uh, I don't, a million dollars is not enough, but I'll take it. Um, a couple of things. First of all, I think there's a, a very strong opportunity in our school system, starting from middle school, to actually create a pipeline that goes from middle school all the way to the completion of a bachelor's degree. So that would require a partnership between the school district and our uh, our, um, our local, at least our, our one or two local universities, uh, who happens to really you know produce most of our teachers. And if we were able to really, and, and there are students right now who would talk to you right now and say, you know, I would have been interested, students that I recruited for Gilbert Stewart, who said, had I known that there was an opportunity to actually become a teacher and what it entailed and a principal or a guidance counselor, I would have loved to have had that opportunity in high school. And then if I were able to go to college and someone gave me, um, you know, a couple of thousand dollars every year that I was in school to buy my books or pay for at least part of my classes. Um, because a lot of, again, a, a lot of these are, are students of color from, you know, poor families. And I was guaranteed that I would actually have a job when I completed my bachelor's degree that I could keep. So again, pipeline middle school through high school, complete your four year, year degree, and then come back and serve as a teacher. And I wouldn't be bumped by seniority, you know, I would gladly do that. So I think that there's an opportunity to create a pipeline and there are many across the country where they actually recruit students very early on and they shepherd them through the program. Not everyone necessarily makes it, but if you have a, you know, a cohort of 100 students in two or three different high schools and you follow those students all the way through and support them all the way through to the completion of their first degree, especially first generation students, um, the, the numbers look pretty good. And I think that's an opportunity here because we're a small state, you know, even though that we're 24,000 students in Providence relatively, it's still a small district when you look at you know other districts like Los Angeles, et cetera. And the other thing I would do is spend the money once students, once young people or new teachers of whatever color come to the district, we have to have a long-term program to support them, an induction program the, where they would receive a coach. They would have weekly observations and would be, be able to get feedback and have someone who is their near peer to really support them through those first three years, which we know are the hardest years to get through as a new teacher, no matter what color you are, but particularly for, for students or for teachers of color, especially when you're in a climate and culture sometimes that is not supportive of, uh, of people of color. So I think that I would spend my money in uh, creating a really strong pipeline uh, within our system and then create, spend, spend the other portion of the money in uh, an induction uh, program that would help support and have them stay within, um, within our district. 
Thank you. Zach, it looks, I saw lots of nods of agreement. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's exactly dead on. I mean, I think when I go back to the slide where we see the national average and where we are, and you either need to do one of two things, you either need to find more applicants that are out there, either in Rhode Island or in our neighboring states or even further, or you need to build that pool of people that don't, aren't in it, aren't in the teaching pool yet because they don't, they may not know that's the profession for them. So like 100% what um, Nicole said around like developing pipelines uh, from within, whether that's from student to teach, uh, to becoming a teacher, whether that's our TAs, whether that's our substitutes. I mean, these are folks who are in our schools. We already, they've been interviewing since they got there as, as teacher assistants. And so, um, and, and so these are, these are areas where you, where it's helping those people along to become teachers because they're not reflected in that applicant pool. And so it's, it's our job to build that pool. You know, I, I do think there, there are some, you know, if the if this million dollars was out there. In addition to that, it's also thinking through what what incentives could we put in place to attract people from outside, so uh, or from other places in Rhode Island. And I think that is thinking through some significant incentives that you know, like having people who would pick up and move um, from anywhere to another part of the country to to change jobs is not something people do for for small for small incentives. So I think. That is um, one thing to think of is just like, what do we, how could we think of really aggressive ways to recruit experienced teachers from elsewhere um, in, the, in the state or, or, or other ways? And, and like we all said, it's not all about incentives, but that doesn't hurt. Um, and then to echo another point Nicole made, I think it's not a recruitment, not strictly recruitment, but having a strong induction program helps you recruit because the new teachers who then talk to their friends and others who are trying to find out where to work know like, okay, this is um, this is a place that will support teachers. And to the point um, Paige had mentioned, like that is an area we know we like in these times need to work on um, given how, how the pandemic has just been challenging for adults, students and everyone. So, so I, so I do think having, having solid investment in induction is not just good to retain people, but it also helps recruit others who know that they, you know, are that this is a place to come. Thank you, Zach. John, where would you invest this money and, and why? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I think Zach's right. There's the short term and, and the long term. And so another alternative for short term is how do you get information out there to, to, to folks, right? How do, how do we talk about these things? You know, Paige was talking about this investment in anti-racist racist pedagogies here. How do we how do we think about get, getting that word out to other places? How do we get um, teacher preparation programs um, in other states to realize that there are it's it's an easy pathway here, right? We have reciprocity. Um, how does that information flow in more targeted ways than uh, than you know? I think that that's how, you know you can identify um, and do this more cost effectively by by really targeting. Um, targeting this, this messaging. In terms of the longer term pieces, I, you know, I agree whether that's a, a sort of grow your own type, type pathway or if that's working with the tremendous talent that lives and resides in the Rhode Island, in, in the Providence area um, through teacher residency programs or things like that, prepar teacher preparation that's more targeted to meet the needs um, of the district. Um, and then I think this school climate piece is, is tremendously important, right? Not only, you know, School leaders play a key role, but you know we, when we talk with teachers elsewhere, right? It's their colleagues um, who are critically important. And when you're a, a young teacher in a school with supportive senior colleagues, that makes the world a difference. Um, and when you're not feeling welcome, then that's that that, that that's a really hard uh, hard place to be. So how do we think about teacher leaderships and teacher leadership and, and colleagues in order to to do that? And some of those things, I think. Take money, and some of those uh, some of those can can operate in, in less expensive ways. Thank you, John, and that actually goes hand in hand with a um, comment that we received from Superintendent Peters uh, to the panel, who you know has vocally said since him joining us here in Providence that great teachers will follow great leaders. So we should definitely look at uh, investing in leadership development. So with that said, my next question goes to Nicole, Page, and Zach. A central goal of the district's uh, turnaround action plan is to increase the diversity of the teacher workforce so that it is more reflective of our student body. What are the main barriers that are preventing teachers of color from entering the classroom and what can Rhode Island 
or the district, Providence Public School District, do to remove or lower these barriers, both short and long term? I'll go first this time. Um, so some of the barriers that we're seeing, um, and it's also mentioned in the brief, is that there are some what I would call like mechanical barriers that were identified in the brief, you know, like the short application windows, the timing of postings, um, the following up with unsubmitted applications. I feel like that is kind of how things are done that can be um, just looked at and tweaked and adjusted. Those are some short-term things that can be done. I think the, the harder question is about in, in the long run, how do we do, how do we fix this long-term? Um, and the two things that really stuck out to me as identified as long-term challenges that we absolutely need to tackle um, comes from the, in the brief where it says many of the teachers who apply for teaching positions, teachers tend to work close to where they grew up. And that there's, of course, a lack of applicants in these um, high demand areas, especially with math and science. Um, and so together, I was look, looking at that and seeing, well, if many of our teachers are coming from close to where they grew up, what about our students today? And this kind of gets to the previous question about creating a pipeline. And what are the experiences that our students are experiencing right now? And are they experiences that will make them want to come back? So I know Nicole mentioned, you know, she has worked with some um, students who've talked about wanting to come back. Again, to Superintendent Peter's point about great leaders, right, will attract people. But how do we make this uniform? How do we change this experience for students that no matter what school they're in or what classroom they're in, that they are having a good experience where they will want to come back and to give back to Providence Public Schools and be a part of the change? Um, right now, if we're looking at our survey works data from 2020, it looks like students' experiences are pretty negative and, and abysmal. So 24% of Providence High School students, only 24% feel connected to adults in their school building. About 40% of high school students in Providence feel like they belong in their school. We know that students of color are disproportionately suspended in schools. So this is not looking like great feelings for students. Um, and then if we also look at academically, are we preparing our students to be able to come back and be math and science teachers? As a state, we know we have a lot of work to do to increase student proficiency in math. Um, but if we look at Providence and specifically for students of color, only 11% of Black and Native American students in eighth grade are um, meeting expectations in the RICAST and 9% for Hispanic students. Our pipeline begins here, right? Our pipeline begins now with our eighth graders, uh, the middle school students, right? The high school students building all the way up so that they are prepared, able to take on positions in these high demand areas and they want to do so. Uh, I think there's opportunities right now. There's a pipeline we can kind of tap into right now. We have great teacher's assistants, many of whom are um, folks of color. We have organizations like the Equity Institute, whose um, program called Edu, Leader, Edu Lead Fellowship is partnering with College Unbound to connect teacher's assistants, folks who are in the schools but not certified, helping them get their college degree and become certified teachers. This is a really diverse applicant pool. 90% of them are multilingual in this year's class. So there's some great potential here. Um, then if we invest in those long-term strategies and keep them in mind, uh, we may be removing future barriers for educators of color to enter Providence. Thank you, Paige. Nicole, would you like to follow up with that? I know she talked about proficiency and the academic preparedness of our students in terms of what you're seeing at Gilbert Stewart Middle School and within the district. Yeah. So I don't, you know, so I, uh, so Paige, you know, snap, snap, snap for everything that she just shared. I agree with everything. Um, we have to do a better job um, all around in educating our students. Um, and part of that, is providing the right experiences for them and having people in front of them who can do that. So one of the things I heard loud and clear when I talked to our new teachers yesterday and I said, what are some of the barriers? One of the things that came up, there were some short-term things like the amount of money it costs, for example, to purchase, you know, to have to get the certifications. Um, and so there are some ways we could get around that, maybe trying to create a fund where when we have new teachers coming in, 
who are already not making a whole lot of money, being able to really have a pool of money, some type of a fund or scholarship to pay for those certifications. I think that would make a huge difference. But the thing they talked about loud and clear is the importance of the climate and culture. Um, and because many of them were students in our schools and now are teaching in our schools, they're really seeing, um, their eyes are wide open um, because some of the, uh, while they have had very positive experiences for many people, um, some of the things that they've heard in the hallways or in some of, you know, passing by some of their, who are people who are now their colleagues um, have, not, have been unkind. Um, and, and, you know, some, you know, sometimes racist, biased remarks. And, um, and we talk about that openly and how you address that. But one of the things they said was that if it weren't for the fact that they had the support within the school that they knew every week they came together and they also knew that they had leadership that would not put up, put up with that nonsense and would address it, that they feel safe and protected to be able to stand up and, and step up. But their concern was how do we make that happen for all people in all of our schools? And so it goes right back to what the brief, um, what came out in the brief, what Paige mentioned, this idea of it's a multi, I think it's multi-pronged. We have to do better in terms of creating an anti-racist, anti-biased, climate and culture in all of our schools, grade, you know, from kindergarten to 12th grade. We have to do that. There's no, there's no getting around that because we can bring people in and convince them to come. The question is, will they stay? And, and none of the young people that I spoke to, none of the new teachers I spoke to yesterday talked about salary. Salary wasn't an issue. They, they want to be here. They are, they're, you know, they want to make more money, of course, but Salary was not the issue. What, what will keep them here is knowing that they are welcome. They, they said that they need to feel more welcomed. Um, they need to feel more confident. And sometimes some of the things that their colleagues may have shared or some things that they have heard uh, from some of their colleagues really kind of ruffled their confidence in their ability to actually step up and do this work. So I think that, I think that climate and culture is a huge piece. I think also having strong leaders, as Superintendent Peters said, that I mean that that's important. That's absolutely important because it's the leader that sets that vision. It's also the leader that addresses those issues within the school. And you have to have leaders who are willing to step up and and actually say, no, this is not right. This is not, you cannot do this. And then also provide solutions. So I think, I don't think it's one answer. I think it's many answers. And I think um, I think although each school is different we definitely need to work on climate and culture across this district. Um, and I'm talking not just from a perspective of Gilbert Stewart, um, it's not just about Gilbert Stewart, it's really across the district, K-12. With my experience, it's something that continues to come up. And as a person of color myself, um, who came here from some, you know, from another state, and I've been here for close to 20 years, I can tell you that some of the things that I've experienced as an adult here, teacher and principal and central office person, um, some of the things I've heard, some of the things people have said to me, the way I've been treated sometimes, um, I know what they're saying. Um, and it takes a lot to really push past that. You need a support system to really, um, to really you know, push against that. So I think I'm excited about a lot of the work we're doing in the district right now, because for the first time, we're actually having the conversations and we're making people feel uncomfortable and you can't get to the solutions for these problems unless you start to feel uncomfortable. Um, and so, you know, I think we're on the right track, but we have a lot more work to do. If we want to, if we want to bring people here, young or old, to Providence uh, to work here, then we have to make sure we provide a safe and supportive environment for them to thrive, for them to be able to um, have the confidence that they need to really get in front of our students and give them that quality education. At the same time, we need to make sure that the students that we're producing and graduating every year are graduating um, proficient, right? In, in English and mathematics so that they actually can complete college in four years and be ready to come back to us to, um, to serve our students. Hence, if we have some type of pipeline, I love what Paige said, I saw that research as well. People tend to want to work where they live. Um, I, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, everybody comes from somewhere. One of the things I found interesting when I came to Providence in Rhode Island is that people stay, stay here. They want to stay close to home. They don't really, they may go somewhere for college, but many of them come back. And so I think we have an opportunity 
to um, to hook on that, right? And those people who want to stay here to really create an opportunity for them to come back and then have an opportunity to be in our schools while also changing or creating experiences for our young people as early as sixth grade, really pushing the idea of, of education as a profession and then giving them experiences that would be positive and make them want to actually um, engage in the profession. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Zach, I know Nicole mentioned some of the work that the district is doing. Would you be able to share a little bit more specifically about what Providence is doing to lower or eradicate the barriers um, for teachers of color trying to enter the profession here? So a, f a few things, and I mean, I would just echo everything Paige and Nicole said around some of the technical barriers, whether it's paying for certification and things like that, but also the making staff um, feel welcome and supported in our schools. So um, a, a couple things that were that are happening, but obviously I say this because it's a good starting point, but we know we have much, you know, much work to do. Um, one is uh, we were proud to be awarded a, a grant from the Department of Ed, the Federal Department of Ed for $10 million to support leadership development. And a key, key part of that is developing leaders at all levels, but particularly diversifying um, our, uh, our leadership ranks from APs to principals. And you know that is incredibly important when you're hiring that as the person walking in the door and you're interviewing that you like, it, it matters who you interview with and how you and, and how and who you interact with at the school. So I think there is um, that work to, you know, I think it's important to diversify uh, our leadership ranks full stop, but it also is, a, is an excellent way to improve and support Increasing the diversity of our of our teaching force, so that is that is important work um, that is going on. Um, we're also, you know, the work of increasing teacher diversity has been something that has been over the years, I think, taken on by different parts of the organization. Um, and and we're uh, whether it's in HR or whether it's through some great work by uh, Dr. Mullen, um, but we're excited that through the partnership with the Rhode Island Foundation will be having a role that is specifically focused on um, recruiting, developing, and retaining uh, teachers of color. And so helping to systematize some of the pipeline work that's out there and par partnering with, with places like the Equity Institute and others on pipeline programs for our teachers, but also thinking about how we bring in other teachers, uh, administrators to serve as mentors as, as those students, not, not just for the getting better at your job, but getting, you know, feeling belong, you know, more belonging and, and, and connections with their colleagues. So I think that is work that is just getting started. So there's a lot, a lot to do there. Um, and then I think it's just continuing to remove any of the barriers we heard around the quick posting timelines and things like that, that, you know, I think disproportionately impact people of color who, who may not have the access to um, some of those positions outside of what's on the, uh, our, job, our job posting site. Um, you know, we, we've, a lot of this is looking at our data too, and just making sure we're, we're being thoughtful about it. So like, as we review our hiring committees over the past three or four years, we've seen that about only 13% of our uh, representatives on hiring committees are people of color. Uh, and so that is something that we, again, uh, is important having, you know, all the research shows that having uh, diverse hiring committees uh, is important to yielding better outcomes in terms of who you're hiring. So those are all things that we're working to uh, address. Um, which we're proud of, but but like everyone said, there's a long, long way to go. Thank you, Zach. And I see that we only have 15 minutes left, so we really want to get to uh, some audience questions. Um, before I do open up the um, the chat, I do want to say that um, you know I think it's important to address some pushback that we received around this event, specifically um, around the fact that there wasn't a current classroom teacher on our panel. Um, very valid, and which is why we hope to hear from teachers currently in our audience um, with your experiences and recommendations and solutions for the topic we're just, that we're discussing, but also to note that this is the first in several of these panels that we will have um, covering a diverse group of stakeholders. So with that said, if you have a question, you can drop it into our chat and we will uh, unmute you on our end so that you may uh, ask the question of uh, specific panelists. And I know, I know that we received a question earlier. So while people are, are dropping questions in, I know Alex Molina had asked a question specific to a pipeline for leadership. 
So no, Alex, if you'd like to, if we can unmute Alex Molina and he can ask that directly. Thank you so much for doing that. I apologize. Uh, yeah, the question was, I know I'm hearing a lot about building a pipeline and I know city or I'm Alex Molina from City of Providence, something we're thinking about, how do we get, create a core members for begin to attract local core members, but eventually something personal is, um, we would love to create a pipeline for teachers, but we know in order for change to truly happen, we have to get folks to look like our students, who look like me in leadership positions. So my question was, as, as the district is thinking about this, A, are you thinking about creating a pipeline for teachers, but then to ensure they retain uh, teachers of color, what is, does it look like for them to eventually become administrators? And I think Scott, uh, some folks briefly talked about it, but I would like to hear more about that. I'm happy to share a little bit about um, uh, the the grant I mentioned, and then, but but Nicole and others, like uh, from your experiences, I'd love to hear what what either has been done before that we should continue or, or revitalize. But um, you know, so this grant is about it's uh, a three year grant, and it's around it's explicitly developing leadership. And I think that was it was it, it's it was a grant broadly defined for human capital. But um, Superintendent Peters felt most you know feels extremely strong about leadership and so that's where we focused. So um, part of this is having more frankly defined pipelines to leadership in terms of like, hey, the expectation is that you're gonna move into this role for a few years, then become an AP, then become a principal. So people can kind of see what that next step is. And it's not as, you know, you can never fully avoid this, but it's less like opportunistic, like, hey, something opened and now we're looking for someone who is it. And it's really about being more explicit about developing a bench of talent and doing that in a thoughtful way about you know, cultivating people, not just who raise their hand, but who we want to recruit and build into the. Um, so uh, I think, you know, to, to be, you know, it's in the early, we, it was just awarded. So it's something that we're doing some planning work, but some of the like the um, characteristics or the, some of the, the aspects of the program will be, uh, you know, residency model where people will be fully or partially released from their role to learn from a more experienced principal. Um, so that it's not, you know, you can never avoid fully being thrown into the, to, to a role like that, but it gives people some time to learn from the pros we have in the district on that. So um, that's one important aspect of it. And, and it not only gives you opportunities to build folks who are becoming, who are teachers becoming uh, APs, but some of our more experienced principals who are looking for a way to expand their influence um, to other schools, to other people in the district, that is, that is, uh, you know, it'll, it'll allow for roles that uh, uh, that do that, but but lots of work to be done there. Thank you. So there's this is a question that was um, sent to us previous to the the panel when uh, registrants um, registered. So the question is, what suggestions do you have to address and improve the passive recruitment methods that exist to increase the number of BIPOC educators in our classrooms? And there's a, a sub question. Did you target specific job board sites or community partners to advertise in an attempt to recruit educators of color in a predominantly white field? Would you mind repeating the first part of the question? Sure. What suggestions do you have to address and improve the passive recruitment methods that exist to increase the number of BIPOC educators in our classrooms? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best here. I think, so, you know, some of it was having, we, you know, one of the, I guess the silver lining of some of the challenges around travel is that a lot of the recruitment events have been virtual this year. And so it has allowed our, the staff that we've redeployed to, um, to serve as kind of recruitment staff have been able to go to um, historically back uh, college events or, or others where we haven't been able to travel previously, where we might have to travel in future years, but we've been able to extend our reach in that way because um, both because we have the, the people to do it now, but but because a lot of those events have been have been made virtual. So that's that's obviously not a long-term way to fix it, but um, but that is um, that I think has been one step we've we've taken this year. Um, one thing we haven't solved, but I'd love to figure out ways to do it is, you know, so much of any profession, but I know in, in the teaching profession in particular, it is word of mouth is important and referrals are important. So how we encourage, incentivize market in that way beyond just, you know, um, online marketing, which I think can, ha can have a wide reach, but, you know, people don't always pay attention to. So how you find, uh, 
you know, the next level of getting people interested, whether it's hearing from a, from a, uh, a colleague or someone they've worked with before. Um, so that's, that's, that's some of the, the work there, but um, would be interested in other thoughts as well. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to unmute Anna Cooperman, um, who had a, a question or comment that she shared. Anna. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad that we're having this meeting. Um, so exciting. Um, so I'm actually, I've been meeting with a couple of teachers, a couple of teachers from the Providence Teachers Union. We started a, a racial justice committee this summer and one of our committees out of that is isn't kind of an ad hoc Providence kids to Providence teacher pipeline. And we've only met twice and really just trying to figure out who are the players in Providence in terms of kind of uh, partners in higher ed and, and the, the new kind of program at JSEC and the program that we have at Mount Pleasant for teacher academies and how do we kind of make all those connections. And, you know, one thought that I've been having a lot um, is, you know, what are the classes that we could offer to our students, to our high school students around the city? Could we have a cohort of kids in different in different high schools who are meeting and and beginning to talk about this is like, this is an exciting profession. This is something, you know, that we want you to be part of and, um, and thinking about, uh, thinking, you know, just thinking creatively about ways to get kids, our kids, our Providence students um, involved in this. Because I, honestly, I think those are the people that stay. The people that stay in Providence are the people who are from Providence. Um, I, you know, and, and I've worked in teacher induction, worked with a lot of wonderful um, Teach for America kids. Um, and I don't know what the numbers are. Nicole, maybe you do. <laughs> um, what the numbers are of kids who stay uh, from TFA, I don't think they're very high. And, and so if we could really, if we can tap into the talent that we have here, our students, I think that would be, I, I, I'm so excited about that. I'm so glad to hear people talking about it. And I really want to be part of that. Do we have any of our panelists who would like to take the question? I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to address uh, Anna, you know, um, when we talked about this multi-pronged approach, right? So um, having a pipeline here, um, and I'm, I'm excited too about the fact that we now have a, a second um, teacher academy coming down the pike. So Mount Pleasant and JSEC, that's gonna be amazing. Um, but it's also about how we shepherd those students, I think, before they get to high school, what experiences they have uh, in middle school. Uh, part of our advisory program, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the pieces of our advisory program this year that I'm excited about is we actually have a program that every school has um, in middle school and high school. And I think part of our work could be really um, focused in the middle schools, starting with our fifth and sixth graders around professions and careers. Um, but I also think teaching is a very unique um, profession because it's also something that people experience, right? So it's not just about what you teach about the profession, it is also what you experience as a student. Um, and so I think it's both. I think it's providing more opportunities for those early conversations around professions and really being super focused um, on the teaching profession, but also expanding that. So when we talk about um, providing uh, recruitment for administrators. One of the things we've been doing here at Gilbert Stewart is we're not just talking about, okay, you know, we want you to hurry up and finish up that certification so you can get your teacher certification. We're also talking about careers in education because oftentimes people forget that, you know, teaching is, a, I think, the best job in the world um, and it's the hardest one in education, but there's also other opportunities, coaching, guidance counselors, assistant principals, principals, superintendents. I mean, we need to really start to really open up the conversation around the profession of education and what the possibilities are in a very um, intentional way. And I think I agree with Anna that we have a unique opportunity in Providence to do that from within, but also when we bring people in um, around um, induction or teacher recruitment, really, you know, open up the sky's the limit for them. and giving them good experiences uh, from their colleagues, from them teacher colleagues, but also if you have strong leaders, those, those strong leaders in schools will also be a recruitment for teachers to say, you know what, 
I want to be like you one day. I'd love to run a school. I'd love to be an assistant principal. So I think it's, I don't think it's one facet. I think it's multifaceted and it really encompasses everything we've heard here. It's about what we teach, but it's also the experience that we provide for people. I love what Paige said about what's good for students is good for teachers, right? What's good for students is good for adults. We have to do, we have to provide those same, uh, the same things we're talking about right now in terms of experiences for students. We have to provide those same students, those same experiences for teachers. And then we have to have a very intentional way of shepherding all the way through. So having the teacher academy is wonderful, but when we finish the teacher academy at Mount Pleasant or JSEC, what's the next step for me? So if I complete that teacher academy, do I have a guaranteed admission to Rhode Island College? And if I get into Rhode Island College guaranteed admission, do I get part of my financial aid taken care of? Are my books paid for? And when I finish at Rhode Island College and finish up my master's or my uh, program in, uh, in teaching, do I have a guaranteed opportunity to get a job in Providence? So I think that we have that pipeline needs to be uh, filtered through all the way to the end so that people see the end in mind. And again, that requires some strong partnerships, I think. Um, and it also requires people understanding that this process is not just the school department's responsibility. I, I think that the community itself has to realize uh, responsibility. And in doing so, where are the partnerships, some of them have already been mentioned, where we can have some synergy with our school district to really make this happen for kids. So if you're talking about the pipeline that I just described, that's pretty extensive, but I do believe that we have young people who would do it, but we have to have the resources and funds to make that happen and make it a reality for our young people. Thank you, Nicole. That, already, that million dollars is already spent. It was spent before we got it, huh? Uh, we have time for about one last question, and I believe we're going to open the microphone up for Kaz Inez. Kaz, whenever you're ready. Looks like you're still muted, Kaz. Uh, Kate, let's see if we... So I believe Kaz has a question about including teacher voice including teacher voice. Uh, I'm not, Kaz, are you able to unmute or Kate, can we? Yeah, I can jump in. So Kaz had a question about um, how, how PBSD is thinking about including teacher voice and hiring their leaders and retaining them. Uh, it seems teacher opinion isn't always included when uh, choosing and retaining leaders. So how can you, how can we get their voices heard? Yeah, I mean, a, a very fair point and something we as a district as we're thinking, you know, as we talk about that leadership development work we're doing and how we think of community voice and, you know, as a, as a leader of a school building, it's important that that person is, um, you know, has support from teachers, students, community, families. Um, so that is something, you know, that we, um, you know, has been done, but needs to, from, from CAS experience, it's, it sounds like not consistently. So that is something that is important, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's it's for the success of the, the leader in the school that they are, you know, it's, it's kind of a match and that people, the person who is is moving into that school wants to be there and the community is excited about them being there. Um, obviously, retention re retention conversations are tricky because those are high stakes and all that, but but certainly as getting teacher voice in, in an under, like part of a part of a, a strong school leader's job is building, um, you know, making a welcoming and supportive environment. So we in the district and others need to be doing our job to make sure we know whether that's happening or not, um, whether that's on the on the front end with hiring or when we're we're thinking about um, someone's longer term career path. Thank you, Zach. So we are just at time and we do want to honor everyone's time. So with that, I do want to say thank you to our panelists um, for just, you know, sharing your time, your insight and uh, recommendations for actionable steps as we discuss in this um, panel. And thank you to our audience for sharing both your experiences and also offering some solutions based on those experiences. I do know that there were some um, uh, I'm sorry, audience members who had shared recommendations in the chat. So we'll make sure to capture those and follow up with you personally um, 
in the future. And we hope to see you all at future events around um, this and other educational topics that we plan to host. So thank you again, everyone. Have a good evening um, on behalf of the Annenberg Institute and Brown University. Thank you.